have to put into practice the things that he's taught you. Look at it. When we learn something in the Bible, we have to use it. We got to start putting it into practice. We start got to start doing those things. And as we do those things, we get better at them. We start seeing those results. It's funny because I think I've said this before, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's insanity. People do that every day, though. You know, they want something different in their life, but they want to do the same thing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. God is not going to step down into your situation and just change it, just smash you in the face. Because the bottom line of it is, is that if he did that, then you would be going against who he was. He'd be going against his will because his will is for us to believe him and see him come into an area. It's not, it, it's up to us. Now, to help you guys, and this is what I'm finishing with, to help you guys remember what you need to do as the church, that God has given us the keys. We have the keys. You know, we can lock the door, unlock it. I, I got that. I use the... Uh, the acronym KEY, K-E-Y. So it's going to help you remember these things, all right? So if you want to do something about the devil in your life and the life of others, this is something you can use. The first thing that you need to have, the K in key stands for knowledge. Okay, look at Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19. All right. And this is what Jesus said. He said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall injure or harm you. That's knowledge right there. Important that you know that you have authority over the enemy. The church has authority over the enemy. We have power to put the enemy under. You know, it's, it's our right. It's our responsibility. We have that. The K in, in key stands for knowledge that you have to know what belongs to you. How do you know those things? How do you get to know what belongs to you? You can get into the Word. You can read it. You can find where it says. It's in other people preach. Listen to what they're saying. You want to get the Word of God. You want to hear it. You want to read it. You want to get it around you. The more that you get to know, the more that you're going to be able to stand on it. That knowledge is a weapon, power in your hands to be able to use against the devil. The E is enough. God has enough power to back you up. When you stand on his word, he will not fail you. Never. You know, in the story I was thinking about, in Numbers 12, you know, it's interesting because God says this. He says to Moses, he says, is the Lord's power limited? You know, he asks him this question, is the Lord's power limited? Can I not act? Can I not do the things I told you I'd do? And it was amazing because when he had sent, in Numbers 13, he'd sent these spies out to check out the promised land. You guys have probably heard the story before, but he, it says they sent out um, 12 spies. Two of them out of all of them, basically only two, Joshua and Caleb, they were the only ones that actually said, we can go and take this land. It's a great land. It's beautiful. It's, it's wonderful. Let's do it. Let's go. It's ready. And all the other people said, oh, no, they're giants. It's too, they're too big. You know. But I like one of the things that Joshua said. He said that, that the giants, these, these guys out there that we're so afraid of, they have become our prey. You know, he didn't look at himself as the as the little rabbit running from the coyote. He looked at himself as the as the top of the food chain. He goes, look, why? Because God's on it. You know, they are our prey. I like that word that he uses. Like, they're you know, they're our prey. They're you know, they're these little rabbits. I don't care what they look like, because in God's eyes, when it comes down and you compare them to God, they're nothing. You know, they he saw God's power as being unlimited. That no matter how big the giant was, no matter how big the problem might be that God was enough. That's all he needed. The church has to realize that no matter how big the trial might be, no matter how big it might seem, it's amazing because for so long, you know, I would say back in the 90s, I think it was probably mid 90s, I remember when I first became a Christian and hearing about the message of, of, of the gospel going all over the world and I start hearing about these huge mega church and I'm thinking, all right, this is amazing because this is how God's gonna bring about his end, you know, the end time harvest where he's preaching the gospel to the whole world and all these big gigantic mega churches. And that was my idea of how God was going to reach out the world. I could have never imagined that God was going to use something so different like this, just house churches all over the place. But you know, now because of the way things have changed, you know, God's power is unlimited. He's enough. He can bring this about any way he wants to. And it's amazing that, you know, now, I mean, we're seeing how where all these little things like this are happening, where little house churches everywhere and just the gospel being preached all over the world, even in places you couldn't imagine. You don't need these giant mega churches anymore. It's why, because God's power is not limited. God is not limited. You know, God can do these amazing things. 
they spies, you know, when they went out, they saw the giants as being bigger than God. They saw the land. I like how he said it, that the land devours its inhabitants. I mean, come on. Isn't that funny when you start doubting something, you start blowing these things up as these huge things that they're not? It can seem like some giant thing that's too big for God, you know, but you got you to change your perspective. You got to look up. You got to get out of that. You got to look at things the way they need to be. And, and that's the thing. Caleb and, and Joshua, when they saw it, they saw God being bigger than all the other stuff. But see, God wants us to have the best. God wants us, the church, to have his best, but it's up to us. Now, the why and key, so we got knowledge. You know, the church needs to have knowledge of their authority. They need to know what belongs to them. They need, they need to, to know where they stand. They need to know what's, you know, what their authority is, what belongs to them, what they can do. They also need to understand that God is enough, that his power will break us up. That's the E and key. And the Y and key is you. You're the one doing the binding. You're the one doing the loosening. You're the one with the keys. It's up to you. You know, until the church takes that responsibility, we're not going to see this amazing end time harvest that God has in mind. We're not going to see final rapture because it's up to us. I think I said this last week. It's worth repeating. I don't believe that Jesus is going to come again until his, his, uh, his full will is fulfilled on this earth. And that's up to us. It was like, oh, he just has some time or date that he pulls out of a hat. No, it's up to us. We are the ones that bring about the end time. We are. The church. As we go out, it's funny because it says that when he comes again, he's coming for a glorious church. A church full of glory. A church that's not just some little beat up thing hiding in a corner somewhere, but an amazing church. And I could preach on glory forever, but I mean, the thing is, it's, it's, it's up to us. We are his hands and feet. You know, we do the binding, we do the loosing, we do the praying, we are his voice on this earth. It's our words that he's using, it's our hands and our feet, it's us.